Hello, my name is Dwayne. Welcome to Directional Bible Ministries. This is a teaching ministry uh, that is called to rightly divide the Word of God for the people of God. Currently, we're working our way through the book of Galatians, and last time we were together, uh, we got down to, we did session 20, which is uh, chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. So, so today we are going to just uh, read for context, uh, 1 through 9, and then we'll pick up in verse number 10. So, now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it? When ye knew not God, ye did serve, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? Um, just a little commentary here on uh, verse number eight. Uh, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations of the earth um, be blessed. Am I right there? No, I'm not right. Get down. <laughs> My notes, I'm all the way up there. Let's see. Yeah, we're here, right there. Verse 8. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. That's where I am. Um, this verse is squarely directed at the Gentile believers, still who had been misled by the Judaizers regarding the law. Now, I don't think the Gentile believers necessarily believed that they had to, quote, go back to the Mosaic law because they were never under the Mosaic law, but instead they were being led to believe that they had to obey the Mosaic law anyway, if they wanted to be saved. Remember the whole argument <clears throat> when Paul and them went back to the Jerusalem council was they were saying that you have to be circumcised to be uh, saved. Let's see, you remember back in Acts chapter number 15, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So again, it's these Judaizers here that were guilting the Gentiles in Galatia that they needed to obey the law of Moses. Um, so the verse, how be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are not gods. In other words, you didn't know the God of Israel, but you served other gods. Understand, they were pagans, okay? That's what he's saying. And he says, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and the beggarly elements whereunto ye desire to be in bondage. So we've already established that the Gentile believers were never under the Mosaic law. Therefore, when it says whereunto ye desire to be in bondage, it cannot be referring um, to, um, well, I guess it could. I mean, that specific verse says whereunto ye desire to be in bondage. Um, and they were trying to put them in bondage to the Mosaic law. But I believe when he says, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, he's referring to the bondage, their own experienced bondage in paganism when they worship gods that were not gods. So they were being forced back into bondage, not so much to pagan gods, but un under the law of Moses. Okay, 
And I think that's what he's referring to then when he says, how turn ye again to the weak and the beggarly elements? It's not referring to again back to the Mosaic law, but it's back into the bondage that you experienced under those pagan gods. Now you want to go back into that bondage under the Mosaic law. Either way, the Judaizers would have been promoting the law of Moses, okay, which was bondage still. It was bondage, whether it was in the bondage to their pagan gods or if it was bondage to the Mosaic law. Of course, they were encouraging them to go back, or not to go back, but to go, well, back into bondage, but under Mosaic law instead of the weak and beggarly elements, which they had experienced. Now, notice verse 10 Ye observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Again, the Judaizers were convincing them, both Jew and Gentile, that they had to keep the Mosaic law. Uh, let me get back over there. Galatians 4 and verse number 10. Um, to do so was to pervert the gospel of grace by adding works to it. And understand, anything added to grace is no longer grace. Uh, and we do that in the body of Christ today. Well, you know, you got to have faith, but, you know, you need to be baptized. You know, well, what if I'm not baptized? Well, then, well, then you, you don't have faith, you know. Um, we subtly... Now, some denominations will come flat out and say, you got to be baptized to be saved. You know, well, that's pretty obvious. That's adding work to grace. But then some will say, as I did for many years, well, it's faith. But if you have true faith, you'll be baptized. Um, which is a better argument, but baptism is not required. Um, now, at one time in my life, I felt that uh, believers baptism was an ordinance for, um, the church, the body of Christ. I, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that now, to be honest with you. Um, I believe baptism is, uh, for the kingdom believers, uh, not the grace believers, though I'm not going to condemn anyone that wants to do it. And if they want to do it as a, a show of an outwardly of an inward work, you know, death, burial, resurrection. I don't have a problem with that at all, but I certainly would not say that baptism is required for salvation because that is adding works to grace. And once you add works to grace, you're forfeiting grace. You know, our denominations will say, well, you've got to go to mass. You've got to make confession. Uh, the Pentecostals will say, well, you got to speak in tongues. Are you, you know, you got to, you got to, um, you know, don't smoke, don't chew or date girls that do. I mean, you got to do these things. F faith <laughs> is the grace gospel. The grace gospel is the death, burial, and the resurrection and faith in that full stop, period. There's no comma. There's no colon. There's no semicolon. Full stop. It's faith. Believest thou in thy house, and thou shalt be saved. That's it. You believe, you're saved. Now, certainly all good things or, you know, other things will follow thereafter, but they're not a requirement for salvation, and they can't be a litmus test necessarily either. So he tells them, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And in other words, you're not really believers. Brethren, I beseech you, I'm begging you, be as I am. And I am as ye are. You've not injured me at all. And bear in mind, he's talking to Jew and Gentile Galatian believers that are part of the body of Christ. Paul also feels the need to let them know that he's not angry with them. He just wants the relationship restored that they once had, which he'll describe in the following verses. I mean, you can only imagine the horrible things that you, that the Judaizers were telling them about Paul. And bear in mind, Paul had defended his apostleship from day one. <laughs> they were chasing him from the temple, the synagogues, and they were accusing him. 
you know, go back into the book of Acts. Look at my study on the book of Acts, how they went city to city after him. Um, uh, and Paul is saying, I, I want the relationship to be restored. I, I want it to be like it was before. And, uh, you know, of course, as a pastor, I know all too well <laughs> about how um, people will come after you. You know, I, I used to tell my church, you know, um, you know, you can pat them on the back 99 times, but correct them once and they'll hate you for life. I mean, it's just true. I mean, I pastored, you know, for years and, you know, senior pastor, associate pastor, assistant pastor, missions pastor, maintenance pastor. I mean, elder, deacon, you know, music. I've done everything in the church and um, it's just amazing how fickle people are, you know, I mean, they're, they're fine when, when the sun's out, but when a few drops of rain start coming, uh, they'll turn on you in a heartbeat. Not all, you know, but many, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm almost tempted to say most, to be honest with you. Uh, so Paul, Paul is wanting the relationship restored. He wants them to move away from this observance of days and laws and years. In other words, uh, back into bondage, he's saying, I, I'm afraid that that my labor in your life was in vain. And he says in verse 13, you know how through infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Uh, and he, he's reminding them of that relationship that they used to have with each other before the Judaizers stepped in and ruined it. You know, and that's another thing that <laughs> that I've learned. Uh, very few people leave the church alone. Uh, they got to take somebody with them, you know, and uh, um, you learn that quickly as a pastor. Once, once a cancer has come into the body, uh, there's no easy way uh, to get it out. I mean, just no easy way. The longer it stays, the more it spreads. Um, but trust me, by the time it makes it to your ears, um, it's already done some damage, uh, at least then maybe I was slow. Um, but, um, uh, you know, nobody leaves alone. Uh, that's just the way that works. Um, so he says, you know, how through infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you at the first, uh, and my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness that ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Um, so he makes an interesting comment when he says, my temptation, which was in my flesh, he despised not nor rejected. Now from this statement, he seems to be referring to his eyes or his eyesight. Uh, and I say that because if we look at the final greetings um, in the book, it, it seems like in Galatians 6, 1, you see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. How large a letter. Why would Paul be writing in large letters? Is he just serious, you know, like John Hancock? <laughs> you know? Or did he have eye problems? Could he not see? Um, I have a pastor friend in Texas that is legally blind. And I mean, his notes are just so huge on his laptop or his iPad. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, because he's losing his eyesight. Uh, some have hypothesized that he was suffering from ophthalmia, 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 <laughs> or a similar eye disease, which was very prevalent in the first century due to the poor lighting. Uh, and that would cause the eye to become inflamed and a mucus type leak to come out of the eyes. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, I mean, you, you can imagine reading by a fire. You ever watched a TV show that's set many years and they got gas lighting or they're sitting by a fireplace or, you know, I mean, it's just, they, they didn't have the lighting that you and I have, you know, and they had chimneys with smoke and they cooked in the house and, and all those things, uh, might've led to an eye disease for, for Paul. Um, 
And as you can imagine, I mean, um, he, he may have looked pretty rough, you know? So he says, I mean, you would have plucked your eyes out and given them to me if you could have. So why would he say that if, you know, um, it may also have been Paul's thorn in the flesh that he mentioned. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul said, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So that tells me Paul received more revelations. I got into this debate <laughs> a couple weeks ago on Facebook. Uh, you know, uh, and, and again, this is my journey, you know, and um, we're all on, on this journey together. But, you know, how much revelation did Paul receive in Acts chapter 9? at his conversion on the road to Damascus. I mean, how much revelation did he receive? Um, but I don't think Paul got it all at one shot because he says, um, through the abundance of revelations, I don't, I don't think Paul completely understood that, um, the kingdom was going to be postponed necessarily in Acts chapter nine. Uh, I don't think he necessarily saw, the body of Christ, that the Gentile would be reached um, by him instead of through the nation, which was everything the Old Testament pointed to. Uh, I don't think he totally understood um, that the church would be raptured and that, um, you know, and then God would begin to deal again with the nation of Israel and what we call Daniel's 70th week. I don't think Paul understood all of that at the same time. Now, certainly by the time he penned his prison epistles, I, I believe he had it, but I don't, I don't think he had it all at once. Now, how much did he know? You know, some will say, well, Paul, uh, when, what, what kind of conversion did Paul have in Acts chapter number nine? Was it, uh, did he, was he responding to a kingdom gospel there or was he responding to the grace gospel that Christ gave him? And at that point, he was born into the body of Christ, and he never was a kingdom believer. Well, I mean, I, you know, some people uh, feel pretty dogmatic and pretty strongly about it, but I don't know. I, I know the first time, as far as I can tell, that he laid out the grace gospel was in chapter 13 of Acts. So you've got 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, you got four chapters. You know, I think that's... Um, you know, I don't know, 14, 15, I'm not sure on the math, but I mean, that's, that's a few years later that he actually laid out the grace gospel. Did he understand that in, in chapter nine? I, I don't know. You know, I mean, we study it together and, um, you know, <laughs> you know, but, but I'm not sure, but I do know for a fact, according to second Corinthians 12, verse number seven, that he had an abundance of revelations. So he was, he, 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 God was continuing to reveal things to him, uh, for sure. And he says, and because of these abundance of revelations, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So some people would say maybe this eye disease, um, was grotesque. Uh, and they even talked about his, the way he, he looked, uh, in some of the other epistles, uh, when speaking evil of him naturally, um, you know, Paul, that may have been the thorn in the flesh that Paul was referring to in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 7. So um, let's just go ahead and look at verse 16 through 18. I might therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. <laughs> um, they zealously affect you. They, referring to the Judaizers, are, are zealous about getting you to come over to their side, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. In other words, they want to drive you away from me so that you can be on their team. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, uh, and not only when I'm present with you. So he's warning them to not be offended because he's speaking truth to them. And isn't that the truth? Uh, I don't remember the show, Jack Nichols, Tom Cruise. You can't handle the truth. You know, it was uh, a uh, Marine Corps officer, Lieutenant Colonel, that had issued a code red on a, on a young Marine, and it led to his death. And 
Tom Cruise, who, you know, is a young JAG Navy lawyer, never seen combat, you know, um, he begins to question this old salty colonel. And he says he wants the truth. And the colonel tells him, you can't handle the truth. Uh, you know, most people can only take the truth in small doses, to be honest with you. If you just came out and told them the way it was, you know, sometimes people get a, uh, accused of being blunt. I'm not the blunt as person in the world, to be honest with you. Um, I know people that are. <laughs> uh, they just lay it out there. I get it out. But I, I try to use a little bit of tact and a little bit of timing with it. Uh, but most people just can't handle the truth all at one time. And he, he's saying, don't be offended because I'm speaking the truth to you about these guys. The Judaizers had a lot of zeal in their appeals to them, but they were leading them the wrong way. They were trying to pull them back under bondage. Uh, and, and specifically, the bondage of the law, the Mosaic law. He further tells them that what the Judaizers were trying to do was alienate them from Paul to win them over to their side. And that's what he's saying there in that verse. So um, anyways, we cover quite a bit there. Uh, I'm really enjoying studying uh, this book together and we'll continue to do so. I tried to live this morning on Facebook and I don't know what was going on, but it was chopping out. So finally, I just, I just deleted it. Uh, but I do record it on my, on my, uh, software here. So I'll just upload it, you know, to all the places that it goes. And I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you following along and, and understand I'm not asking you to believe everything the way I believe it. Um, I'm asking you to just question assumptions and that's all I ever do when I talk to people. Just question the assumptions. Why do you believe what you believe? Okay, fine. You believe the church is the bride of Christ. Where are you getting that from? Uh, the words bride of Christ is not in the Bible. So where are you getting that from? Where are you drawing that from? Is it something someone told you? Or do you have some scriptures for that? Um, you know, again, all I'm saying, all I'm doing is I'm rightly dividing <laughs> the word of God for the people of God. So I just encourage you, be a student of scripture, study it for yourself. Don't believe it just because you heard it or someone said it. And I think so much of my life, um, you know, I went through Bible college, I went through seminary, you know, it's what I was taught. I, I taught what I was taught, you know, but for me, to be honest, the bride of Christ is what broke the camel's back. Because I just, I was really having a hard time grasping that. Turned over Revelation chapter number 20. You know, bang. You know, uh, the, dis, uh, the, the, the seeming contradictions. They're not seeming. They are contradicting the message of Paul and the message of James. They were talking to two different people. <laughs> you know, um, you know uh, James was talking to kingdom Jewish believers. Paul talking to grace believers, which was Jew and Gentile. So um, I just encourage you, rightly divide the word of truth, that you be not ashamed. Um, study it for yourself. Make it yours. Not somebody else's. Make it yours. God bless you guys. Remember, God loves you, wants the best for you, and he's working all things out for your good.